My name is Joyce Lucy, and I'm the mom of Corporal Jeffrey Michael Lucy. The last month of his life, he had this flashlight by his bedside, and he was looking for the camel spiders that he could hear running around the room. And when he went over to Iraq, he asked me to hold this coin for him every day so that he'd come home safely. I had no idea that it was after he came home that I should have been holding this coin. Jeffrey's death should never have happened. He was caught between the humanity of what he saw and what he had to do. My son was let down first by the government who sent him to fight their war of choice and destroyed his soul. And then by a VA system that has advanced little in their care of PTSD since the Vietnam time. We'd like to thank the organizers of the Winter uh, Soldier for inviting us to give our testimony of what happened to our son after his return from Iraq. Unfortunately, the tragedy is not that it's just happened to one Marine, but that this continues to happen four years after our son's death to countless others. Names that will never be placed on a memorial wall, though they are casualties of the emotional battlefield that rages on well after the guns and missiles have been silenced. Jeffrey told me that now he only wanted to help people. His voice is now silenced, but ours is not. And we can, and we intend, and I think I'll put these on if I can see better. Um, and we intend to follow Jeff's wishes by adding our voices to others, demanding that our government be held accountable for its actions or lack thereof. There was a quote I heard the other day by Edmund Burke. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. This is an attempt to do something. Get the truth out there about the conflict in Iraq and the lack of adequate treatment, treatment of our veterans are faced with. The young man in, who in January of 2003 was sent to Kuwait to participate in an invasion in which he did not agree was not the same young man that stepped off the bus in July. Our Marine physically returned to us, but his spirit died somewhere in Iraq. As we celebrated his homecoming, Jeff masked the anger, the guilt, the confusion, pain and darkness that are part of the hidden wounds of war behind his smile. Jeff was in Kuwait with the 6th Motor Transportation Battalion. He was a convoy driver. On the 20th of March, he entered in his journal, which I have here, at 10.30 p.m., a scud landed in our vicinity. We were just falling asleep when a shock wave rattled through our tent. The noise was just short of blowing out your eardrums. Everyone's heart truly skipped a beat, and the reality of where we are and what's happening hit home. The last entry is, we now just had a gas alert, and it's past midnight. We will not sleep. Nerves are on edge. The invasion had begun, and Jeff never had time to put another entry in. So, several months after his return, he said that he would like to complete it. We never knew that he did not, he would never get the time to do that. Our fear the whole time he was over there was that he would be physically harmed. We never imagined that an emotional wound could and would be just as lethal. The letters we received from him were brief and sanitized, but to his girlfriend of six years, he said in April of 2003, he felt he had done immoral things and that he wanted to erase the last month of his life. There are things I wouldn't want to tell you or my parents because I don't want you to be worried. Even if I did tell you, you'd probably think I was just exaggerating. I would never want to fight in a war again. I've seen and done enough horrible things to last me a lifetime. This is the baggage that my son carried with him when he stepped off that bus that sunny July day at Fort Nathan Hale, New Haven, Connecticut. Over the next several months, we missed the signs that Jeffrey was in trouble. We had no way of knowing that during his post-deployment briefing at Camp Pendleton, he was told to watch the direction that he was going in his survey, or else he'd be kept there another two to four months. He was careful from then on. In July, he went to the Cape with his girlfriend, and she found him rather distant. He didn't want to walk the beach. Uh, he later told a friend at college that he had seen enough sand to last him a lifetime. At his sister's wedding in August, he told his grandmother, you could, be, you could be in a room full of people, but you could feel so alone. He resumed college in 2003. That fall, we found out that Jeff had been vomiting just about every day since his return. And that kind of kept up right until the day he died. On Christmas Eve, his sister came home early 
to see how he was doing. He had been drinking. He was um, standing by the refrigerator, and he grabbed his dog tags, and he tossed them to her, and he called himself a murderer. We were um, to find out that these dog tags included two Iraqi soldiers that he feels or he, he knows he's personally responsible for their deaths. His private therapist, who saw him the last seven weeks of his life, said he didn't, he didn't wear them as a trophy, but he wore them to honor these men. He had a nightmare in February. He told me he was having a dream that they were coming after him in an alleyway. After his death, we kind of checked the VA records, and uh, he had talked to them also about having nightmares, in which he was running from alleyway to alleyway. Spring break, 2004, began. Three months in which our family watched the son and brother we knew fall apart. He was depressed and drinking. When college classes resumed, he found attending classes very difficult. He had panic attacks, feeling that the other students were staring at him, even though he realized they weren't. He was placed on Klonopin and Prozac, to see if it could keep him in class. Jeff's problems just worsened. He was having trouble sleeping, nightmares, poor appetite, isolating himself in his room. He was unable to focus on studies, so he, could take his so he could not take his finals. An excellent athlete, his balance was badly compromised by the mixture of clonopin and alcohol. He confided in his younger sister that he had a rope and a tree picked out near the brook behind our home, but told her, don't worry, I'd never do that. I wouldn't hurt mom and dad. He was adamant that the Marines not be told, fearing a Section 8 and not wanting the stigma that is connected to PTSD to follow him throughout his life. He finally went to the VA after being assured that they were not part of the military and would not relay any information without Jeff's permission. His dad called and explained what was happening with our son, and they said it was classic PTSD and that he should come in as soon as possible. The problem was getting Jeffrey to actually go in. And it was, he kind of, every day it was tomorrow, I'll go in tomorrow, I'm tired. I, he just didn't have the energy to get up. The day he went in, he blew up 0.328, and it was decided he needed to stay. It was, as it was decided it was, he needed to stay, it took six employees to take Jeffrey down. He had gotten out the door and ran out into the, the parking area. Involuntarily committed for four days, the state did nothing but make him feel like he was being warehoused. After seeing an admitted, admitting psychiatrist, he would not see another one until the day of his discharge. After answering in the affirmative that he was thinking of harming himself and revealing the three methods, overdose, suffocation, or hanging, uh, he was released on June 1st, 2003, a Tuesday. We found out later that he told them on Friday, the day that he was admitted, that he had a host to choke himself. None of this was ever relayed to us. They told us while he was there that he would not be assessed for PTSD until he was alcohol free. But Jeffrey was using this alcohol as self-medication, and he had told us often that's the only way he could sleep at night. That we might, and VA said that we might have to consider kicking him out of the house so he would hit rock bottom and then realize he needed his help. That wasn't an option for us. On his discharge interview, Jeff said there were three phone calls that the psychiatrist took, one of them being just before he was going to tell her about the bumps in the road, the children they were told not to stop their vehicles for and just not to look back. He decided not to after she took the call, feeling she wasn't really interested. On June 3rd, on, on a Dunkin' Donut run, and this is two days after he was re released from uh, the hospital, he totaled our car. Was it a suicide attempt? We're never going to know. No drinking was involved. I was terrified I was losing my little boy. I asked him where he was. He touched his chest and he said, right here, Mom. On the 5th, he arrived at HCC, Holyoke Community College, where he was a student. But because of not taking the finals, he would not be, be graduating. But he arrived there to watch the graduation of his sister. This was supposed to be his graduation also. How he drove his car there, we'll never know. He was so impaired. We managed to get him home, but his behavior got worse. He was very depressed. My parents who saw their grandson often never saw him like this. His sisters and brother-in-law and my dad took him back to the VA. He did not want my husband to go because he felt he was going to be involuntarily committed again. They were waiting for him, but he refused to go in the building. He was intelligent, didn't want to get committed again like the weekend before. They decided without consulting someone with the authority to commit him involuntarily that he was neither suicidal or homicidal, there was nothing they could do. 
Our daughters called home in a panic, saying it didn't look like they were going to keep their brother. In their records, they say the grandfather pleaded for someone to help his grandson. Neither our veterans nor their families should ever have to beg for the care they should be entitled to. My father, my father lost his only brother in World War II. He was 22 years old. He was now watching his only grandson, self-destructing at 23 because of another war. Kevin and I went through the rooms when we knew Jeff was coming back. We took his knives, his bottles, um, anything we felt he could harm himself with, a dog leash, I took a step stool, anything that I thought could trigger some, something in his mind. His car was disabled, not only to protect himself, but to, to protect others from Jeffrey. Kevin called the civilian authorities. They said, they can't, we can't touch him, he's drinking. My child was struggling to survive, and we didn't know who to turn to. There was no follow-up call from the VA, no outreach, though they knew he was in crisis. We had no guidance. What to say to him, how to handle the situation. You hear a lot about supporting our troops, but I'll tell you, we felt isolated, abandoned, and alone. While the rest of the country lived on, going to Disney World, shopping, living their daily lives, our days consisted of constant fear, apprehension, helplessness, while we watched this young man being consumed by this cancer that ravaged his soul. I sat on the deck with this person who was impersonating my son and listened to him while he recounted bits and pieces of his time in Iraq. Then he would grind his fist into his hand and he'd say, you could never understand. On Friday, June 11th, around midnight, my daughter got a call from a girl down the street. Asked, she asked me, where's your son? And I said, Debs, he's in his room, he's sleeping. Well, apparently not. He had climbed out the window and gotten into this girl's car. He wanted some beer. She was, this girl who had known Jeffrey all her life was a little bit scared of him. When I saw him get out of the car, I froze. Jeff was in, dressed in his camis with two K-bars, a modified pellet gun, which the police wouldn't know, and carrying a six pack. He had just wanted that beer. There was a sad smile on his face like a lost soul. When I told him how concerned I was about him, he said, don't worry, Mom. No matter what I do, I always come back. Later, his girlfriend was talking to him on our deck. And she said the tears were just running down his face. The words to a song that he listened to over and over again described him. Whatever happened to the young man's heart, swallowed by pain as he slowly fell apart. And they're going to play that a couple of uh, words from that in a minute. I just want to say, um, after Jeffrey died, we found a note in the cellar, or actually the police had it. And it said, I'm truly embarrassed of the man I became. I am truly embarrassed of the man I became, and I hope you can try to remember me only as a child when I was happy, proud, and enjoyed life. The song. Yeah, could you play the song, please? Well, if you could turn the 
stop it. I think we've got the wrong track. Let me know what's the wrong track the words are Oh, the words, through. can you adjust it? The words are not coming through. Is there a problem with the, the, the sound? Can you, can you start it again and give us uh, a minute or two of that song and, and adjust it so we can hear the, the, the words? We do apologize. Um, yeah, it's not it doesn't seem like this is um, going to work today. Um, technical, we can come back to that song. We're going to move on to Kevin's testimony, and, and maybe if you could try to work on that, and we'll play it at the end of Kevin's uh, testimony. Mr. Lacey. So Jeffrey went through a lot of torment during the, during the intervening weeks. And when I was listening to the first two young veterans talking today, um, they spoke about the letters from the VA. And on June 22nd, um, the VA drafted a letter for Jeffrey, which was setting up an appointment for him on July 13th. Regretfully, he wouldn't be able to make that appointment. On June 21st, uh, it was on a Monday evening I had returned home and Jeffrey was in a total rage. I've never seen him like this. And he was totally irate about the war, about the way he was treated at the VA, about so many different things, to the point that I actually had to resort to calling the vet center at approximately 7.30 that evening. Um, the people at the vet center and the people at the VA, we want to stress that were very, very good people. And the angel that answered us at the vet center that evening um, got me to calm down and got Jeffrey to calm down wonderfully. So later that evening, we had decided that we were gonna try to go out because he had become reclusive in the house. We were gonna try to go out for a steak dinner the following night. At about 11.30, quarter to 12, Jeffrey asked me for the second time within the past 10 days, if he could just sit in my lap and I could rock him for about, well, for a while. And we did. We sat there for about 45 minutes and I was rocking Jeff and we were in total silence. As his private therapist that we had hired said, it was his last harbor and his last place of refuge. The next, more, the next day I came home it was about quarter after seven. I held Jeff one last time as I lowered his body from the rafters and took the hose from around his neck. As a result of our son's experiences as well as ours, between May and June 2004, and our subsequent experiences to the present day from walking with others through parts of their journeys through the veterans' health care system, we offer these few observations. First, why does it seem that the veteran must meet the system's needs? Was not the health care system developed to meet the needs of our veterans? Was this also not the purpose of the establishment in the 1980s of the Department of Veterans Affairs Special Committee on PTSD? To better deliver the necessary services to our veterans afflicted with hidden wounds? 
Yet, can anyone explain as to why the Department of Veterans Affairs has yet to implement even one of the 24 recommendations fully, as reported by the General Accounting Office in their report dated February 15, 2006, 20 years after the first report? Was this also not the purpose of the VA's Inspector General's report about the quality care issues regarding our son? We were given assurances that steps would be taken to timely, timely to assure that there would not be another Jeffrey. Then approximately two and a half years later, after our Jeff died, there was Jonathan Schultz of Stewart, Minnesota, who died on January 16th, 2007, in the identical fashion of our son, after having gone to the VA seeking help. Was this also not the purpose of the Walter Reed expose and the government's immediate verbal reaction that they would address the issues? And then the CBS News in November 2007, which reported that in the year 2005, this nation was losing an average of 120 veterans per week to suicide. In the midst of all this, the Dale Shalala report was issued. People took note and we asked, what timely and what truly has been done? In December, Michael and Kim Bowman of Illinois recounted their beloved son Tim's story within the halls of Congress. But again, we find ourselves asking, what has been done? The Joshua Umfig bill has turned into law, but that is only the first steps in a long journey if we are truly to honor and support our troops and you veterans, but what more has been done? Many say these words, honor and support our troops, and very few mean them. It is our belief that this is shown so evidently when people, all people do is talk. Even as we talk today, how many more of our beloved troops and veterans have put a noose around their necks or loaded a bullet bullet in the chambers. For helpless and hopeless colors, their tear-filled eyes as they seek refuge from their agonies. This is not moral, this is not ethical. It is not right for people to use their loved ones for political gain. Due to our lack of response as a nation, our government, past Congresses, and probably this Congress, They've all enshrouded the people of this nation, all of us, in shame, disgrace, and dishonor in regard to the treatment of our veterans. We ask the question which veteran Pat Scanlon sings of, where is the rage? We call upon you and the nation to take action necessary to right this terrible wrong. We have taken the limited action which we could. We are not suing this nation. Our family is suing this VA and this government for failing our son and all those who have followed behind him. Let their legacy, it is not as some would have you believe, to call for more of our men and women to shed their blood. Their legacy should be twofold, that of primary prevention, to end this war and never begin another by choice through either deception, ignorance, or the combination of both as well as the establishment of the world's best and most advanced health care system known to mankind for our warriors and our veterans. Not a health care system. <laughs> Not a health care system which creates hurdles and impediments to accessing it. Why must we have a specific piece of paper to show the VA to qualify for services? in this age of computerization. We put a demand on a veteran to search for a piece of paper as possibly that veteran struggles to take his or her next breath trying to stay alive. Why must you travel many miles to access locales where help is located? Many must do this while at the same time confronting the fears and the imaginations of stigma as well as the person, their own personal vulnerabilities. Then, if fortunate, 
to get to be assessed or stabilized. This present lack of resources make the wait time for services unconscionable. Let us look into these issues even further, which well will raise the question, has this system designed to help those afflicted with hidden wounds broken down? The delays to access assessments, the refusal to assess for PTSD while demanding a period of sobriety and substance free, including even the prescribed medications which may have been prescribed by other VA departments or personnel. Once diagnosed, the tremendous lack of resources for treatment, the apparent lack of standardization throughout the system throughout this nation, the lack of follow-up and involvement with the veterans as well as the family. These are only to name a few. We as a nation must take action. We need to educate the community, police, community health personnel, judicial correctional personnel, first responders about combat-related trauma and PTSD. We need to meet the mental health labeling issue. Is PD, PTSD mental health, or is it actually a normal reaction to the completely abnormal situation? This variable itself compounds the issue of stigma. We need to have a Congress and the administration stop the talk of how they support and honor the troops. They must actually do it. We ask how veterans in positions of power and where they could have actually have made a difference. What happened? Where were they? How could they and others over the decades abandoned and left behind their less fortunate brothers and sisters in arms? How could they let this healthcare system become so dysfunctional, especially for all of our loved ones who have sacrificed so much for this nation? Where have the large veterans organizations been? Over the past year, so few voices have been heard from the halls of Congress and fewer from the executive branch. In fact, in 2005, additional funding requests for PTSD treatment disappeared from supplemental budgets while in the darkness of conference committees. Why? We need to apply the resources of this great nation and our people to care for our veterans. We must develop creative, effective programs such as the SAVE program, as established under the Secretary of Veterans Services in Massachusetts, Tom Kelly, to do outreach and actually embrace our veterans and bring them to the help. We need to have the VA challenge itself to move itself from being a lumbering, slothful behemoth to a dynamic, energized, active caregiver, a system in which no one would ever even consider rewarding themselves with $36,000 bonuses while there is so much to be done and so little time to do it. For a nation. For a nation and her people are only as good and great as her people's treatment and care for her warriors, those whom have sacrificed so much. Let us go forth in the names of the known and those unknown, uncounted and unacknowledged, and let us never forget them. In their memories, let us never have to start a war with such ignorance and deception, never to rush and plunge this great nation into a war of choice, and to be totally unprepared to care for our warriors once returned home. Though there will never be a memorial to all of our loved ones, let their names never fade from your hearts or memories, such as Walter Padilla, TJ Sweet, Jason Cooper, Philip Kent, and with the names of so many more. Jeffrey is not the only tragedy. We are not the only family. We and Jeffrey, stand proudly and tall with military families speak out and the Gold Star families speak out, and especially as we stand together with all of you today. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Joyce and Kevin. Our next speaker will be Eugene Martin. Eugene is a native of Oklahoma who attended Langston University. He has four children and three grandchildren. Eugene is employed by the American Federation of Government Employees and has worked in positions of national representative, national organizer, labor relations specialist, and assistant to the president. Eugene. Thank you. I guess it's good afternoon. It is certainly a pleasure to share today with those who have been so directly impacted by the policies of our nation and such adverse impact that there seems to be so many persons who simply do not understand. Representing employees who work in the VA system and at military hospitals throughout this country, we see from the other side of the spectrum those things that are directly impacting uh, the veteran. And like so many of you, those who are attempting to provide the services to the veteran continue to ask the question, why? Why do we as a nation stand seemingly silent on the sideline and permit those who set and make policy to continue to do the things that they are doing? Why do we allow politics to trump the needs of the veterans? Why is it that veteran care continues to be a discretionary funding system rather than a predictable funding system? Just think of the impact of the current system, this discretionary funding system. Each year, as the funding for the different agencies run out, we seemingly see continued application of continuing resolutions, meaning that the VA system runs out of money. Then there's a continuing res resolution that says, oh, we'll give you funds for the next 30 days, funds for the next 60 days. These approaches have harmful delays on diagnostic testing, treatment, hospital admission, staffing to be available to take and process veterans who are coming for treatment, the purchase of medical equipment, filling of vacancies that are there so when there are ongoing vacancies there are, is understaffing of persons who are there to care for and, and treat the veteran. There's this roller coaster of discretionary uh, funding that has tremendous impact on the VA and its ability to provide services uh, to the veteran. We also see closing of facilities we see people having to travel further in order to obtain treatment. And then the oversight that is missing. Something that Congress needs to step up and take control of. Oversight needs to ensure that the money that is there is actually spent on veteran care rather than on excessive bonuses for top management. The General Accounting Office found more than two years ago that the VA spent substantial medical dollars on doing contracting out, illegal contracting out, diverting funds that were designated and earmarked for medical care. The top management in the VA chose to move that money and use it for something other than medical care. Last fall, the VA's Inspector General found that the VA made false reports to Congress about the wait time that patients had to endure, waiting for appointments, waiting for treatment, and we hear the results. Again, these are things that we have got to hold our politicians accountable for. 
stuff is running downhill. Top VA management is saluting to the politicians who are setting the rules, making policy, and the policies hurt. In the Veteran Benefits Administration, VBA, there was over 600,000 disability claims that were backlogged because there was not staff available to process these claims. Again, these are decisions that are being made by the people that we elect to not fund, to not staff, and as a result, it is adversely impacting the veteran. We wave the flag and say we love our veteran, but then we treat our veteran this way. We have much work to do. There is a challenge to build coalitions, to hold politicians accountable. There is a challenge to get this discussion and this debate in front of the rest of America. You know, I made a comment to a couple of our fellow panelists earlier today. It seems like for the last two, three days, we've seen the news media continually talking about things that really had no place. Why could we not have this kind of discussion being brought by the news media? So as to embarrass those politicians who have chosen not to fund, not to staff, and to not do the things that we promised for the veteran. So we, we invite you to join with those workers who are attempting to provide the services, and let's build coalitions so that we can take control of this process. Thank you. And our final speaker will be Todd Ensign. He's an attorney and director of Citizen Soldier, a GI and veterans rights and advocacy group based in New York. He is the author of Military Life and editor of America's Military Today, Challenges for the Armed Forces in a Time of War. Todd. Oh, I'd like the rest of you, I'm sitting here hearing these accounts one after the other and uh, each story uh, more, more sad more uh, desolate in a way than the, the previous one. It's, uh, and we, and all of you in this room, most all of you, I would bet have uh, no similar stories, if maybe have similar experiences. So it's, uh, we're sitting here, I'm sitting here trying to figure out, well, where, where can I try to take this piece that I have now to, to action? And uh, it's a very, big, a very big question. I'll offer a few observations. One, um, you can't help, I was just seeing a story in the New York Times, uh, they allowed one story along with the Elliot Spitzer uh, excitement, and uh, that, that story was about the budget for next year. And the defense budget next year is going to go over $700 billion. And as Mr. Martin knows, that's just the, 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 the iceberg they let us see. There's all the other add-ons and the discretionaries and supplementals that come later and that you and my children will be paying for for the rest of their lives. But at any rate, we've gone from 340 billion bucks in 2002. I remember when we talked about, gee, are we gonna go over 100 billion? That was a big debate some years before that. 340 uh, in 2002, 700 billion next year. So that's an enormous amount of money. And obviously you can't really separate the, and that's for the military today. That's the tooth ratio. That's the fighting stuff that we're doing now and that John McCain says we must continue to do for up to 100 years. So that's the kind of thing we're looking at. There's part of the problem right there. There's, after all, we know that the, the top 5% are, don't want tax increases. They, in fact, want tax reductions, which, of course, Bush has given them for the last eight years. And the, the middle class so-called person is paying a tax rate, which is crushing. And so you just look at the dollars for a minute to be hard and cold about it, and you see, well, well, my God, where would we begin to do this kind of funding? So that's one very, very big problem we're facing. Um, the VETS hotline, uh, excuse me, the Pentagon's hotline uh, just reported last week that their increased uh, calls have increased 40% each year since 2004, and no one in this room would be surprised with that. Um, Army reports on March 6th, a new study out of, of veteran uh, PTSD, the rates in those who are serving a third tour or fourth tour, amazing, isn't it? 
third or fourth tier, those rates are at a third now, reporting mental illness or and or PTSD. And we're talking about 1.3 million veterans that have already been home from these wards and are out. Uh, it's an incredible, an incredible, mind-boggling number. 400,000, Mr. Martin mentioned 600,000. I, I was working with 400,000, but he's here in Washington and he probably has a more accurate figure than I have. Let me just offer one little anecdote. I grew up in the town of Battle Creek, Michigan, famous for one thing, the production of Kellogg's Corn Flakes. <laughs> Until about five years ago, Bush's Secretary of Commerce, as President of Kellogg, figured out they could make the Corn Flakes along the border of Mexico. Who the hell needs a, a union and pensions and all that? Irrelevant crap. So the plant now is nothing but rubble. 5,000 jobs in Battle Creek, gone which is a familiar story, especially in the, in the north and northeast. At any rate, Battle Creek was the home for many years of a very large and a very pleasant VA, mental, mostly mental health facility. My mother worked there for 30 years as a music therapist. I know the place well. I used to go out there with my band, and we'd play to entertain the, the vets. That hospital at that time had over 3,000 beds in it. Today, that hospital has fewer than 600 beds. That's just one hospital. I'm not claiming I have extensive knowledge of the VA system, but it's very clear that over the last 20, 25 years, there's been real shrinkage of that, that whole system. So as Mr. Martin said again, uh, you can only do so much with what you got, and then if that money that you have is being diverted illegally, then how much can you really hope to see an expansion of service? So that's a very, very tough problem. And uh, I'm going to offer a little bit of hope here. There is a lawsuit that's been filed in California. Some of you may have heard about it by the Vets for Common Sense. They've got some really good um, pro, pro bono lawyers out there with the firm of uh, Gordon Erstbomber. And they have sued the VA seeking a couple things. And one of them is a class action certification over the issue of treatment of post-traumatic stress, the very things that the Lucy's and others are talking about. And it's very interesting in the, in the pleadings. Uh, this, is, uh, this is really the horse's mouth here talking. The VA, and I'll just give you one little sight from it. The VA uh, our lawyer argued for dismissal of this lawsuit. And in his argument, he said, Afghan and Iraq vets are not, quote, entitled to the five years of free health care that's been legislated, as you would call, uh, after their return from, con con uh, from combat. That's mandated by the Dignity for Wounded Warriors Act. But it's the old story. You get into the courtroom, you get into where the rubber really meets the road. This guy's in front of a federal judge fighting to kill this lawsuit. And he's saying, they're not entitled to that. We only have to provide such service, and this is the point about discretionary, as uh, mandated, as is available under discretionary funding, uh, which is available under the level of funding available to us. So essentially saying, Congress can pass a law saying that you have five years of care, but if Congress doesn't give us funds that are sufficient to provide uh, that uh, funding, sorry, bets are off. And so that's, this is the VA at the top speaking. This is not some, uh, oh, okay, <laughs> thanks. This is not some uh, guy uh, down at the, the, uh, the, what the, the VA medical center somewhere. This is a top voice coming from the, from the people that lead the VA. All right. This lawsuit, if it, was, if it can be kept in court, and they're on a second phase of it now. They did win the first motion to dismiss. Now they're on the phase where they're trying to get class certification. If this happened, and believe me, even though I'm a lawyer, I have no illusions about the difficulties of these kind of battles, and we all in this room know that. But if this could be one, then it's possible. You may recall a number of years ago in the same San Francisco court, and let's face it, the reason they picked San Francisco, it's the only place in this country today, including my home city, New York, where you could hope to find a judge that would even begin to apply any kind of equity or justice to a case. And I, that's the fact, because it's the only place where there are any decent federal judges left. That's, that's also pretty much the fact, with a few exceptions here or there. So this case could possibly lead to a, uh, a settlement or some kind of uh, court-structured uh, mandate that would provide for care and actually make the VA uh, uh, begin to shift some of this discretionary funding. But it's still going to be the same problem until Congress steps up and begins to do that sort of thing and, gi and give the funding which is available. It's not, uh, they're always going to have the argument of discretion. So those, those are big, uh, big issues. Um, and so I, I don't want to take much more time. I just want to say that I think that we, 
knowledge is a dangerous thing. Knowledge is an important thing. And I looked driving in here this morning, and look at these idiots out there on the road. Uh, I, a lot of those guys haven't seen a military uniform in a long time, I'll tell you that. No offense. But I just think, what are they doing out there? I mean, American flag, the keep the war going uh, onward and upward. I mean, and here we are saying, listen, we all got to work together to fight this thing. And that's, in a way, typifies the problem we have. And, and Mr. Martin, again, alluded to this, or no, excuse me, uh, Mr. Lucy, about the silence of the big three. Where are they on this, the Legion? the disabled American vets. Of all things, the disabled American vets, you can't even belong unless you have a VA disability rating. And third, of course, and the most pay hey, over the top, VFW. And where are they on this? Where are they on this stuff? Where are they on this lawsuit in California? Why aren't they coming in as friend of the court on that brief? You know, that sort of thing. And so we all know there are reasons for that I won't go into, why they play the role they play and why they've always played that role and all this stuff. And there has been some change, some change over time. But Knowledge is important. We need to know what these problems are and then take it from there. Congress is a slippery slope, as we all know. Anyone who's spent a couple days over there lobbying knows what that's like. But we've got to keep our focus. We've got to fight because the stories here are, are, are heartbreaking. And they're going to be more and more. And I just, I'm going to wrap up with a phone call I got yesterday. I'm not going to play it for you because that would be a breach of their confidentiality. But it was a family in Missouri. And the woman's calling me in New York. And she says, we don't know what to do. She's, she's breaking down on the phone. And she says, our son came home from Iraq. He did a year over there. He hasn't been able to settle down. We haven't been able. And she's desperately trying to understand what to do. And they've taken him to the VA, and they've taken him to other mental health care, and he won't stay or they won't take him, all this stuff. And now he's, he went on a rampage in the house, tore the house apart. The police come, and the family says, he needs, he needs treatment. Don't just take him. And he says, she says he's down in the county jail, and they say they're going to charge him criminally. This is, this is, as we speak, as we sit here today, these are tragic, sad stories. And somehow we've got to rededicate ourselves to this fight, to this exposure of these problems, and to figuring out how we can use the legal system, the judicial, the judicial system, of course, and the congressional pressures that we can build and build a movement for this, because that's what it's going to take. It's going to take an enormous effort, and we need to bring in many more allies and people that understand these problems. And, and, and with that, we have one thing for our side, and that is the truth of the injustice of these terrible experiences, and we need to fight knowing that truth and, and realize at the same time what we're facing. That's my...